everybody, welcome to another drive through board game blog. Today we're actually going to talk about video games. I'm going to do my top 20 video games. I do uh, get requests uh, relatively often for a variety of special interest topics, uh, top 10 music and video games and all kinds of stuff. And so I decided this year I'm going to do some of these sporadic sort of special interest top 10s, if you will. And I thought I would start off with video games. Now I listed out pretty quickly about 20 games. Games. So I just kind of went back through my register and was like, okay, yeah, this game was awesome. I really enjoyed this. Da, da, da. And I could cut it to 10, but then I'm also like leaving out some that I think kind of round out my video game sort of experience. So I didn't want to leave those off. So I will try not to spend too long on each of the different games because it's going to be a list of 20. So let's jump into it. I will do two honorable mentions, which will be clues to some of the other games that will show up and that is wasteland 2 and also pillars of eternity these are very new games i believe they both came out last year uh they're kind of too new for me to really include on the list because some of the other ones on my list i've actually gone back to and played again uh, but these are sort of uh, you call it traditional sort of isometric role-playing games you'll probably see a few of those show up on this list but i really am a sucker for that style of game uh, these two are excellent games if you are looking to get into a new version of some of those older games, those older classics, definitely take a look at either of those two. Um, probably Wasteland 2 because of the theme is more my favorite. The only other thing I'll mention before I get into the list is there are no RTSs on this list, even though I do enjoy uh, StarCraft and Warcraft, and I played like the old Dune game and all that stuff. I do enjoy RTSs, just none of those really eked into my sort of upper echelon. This is a little too much micromanagement for me to really fall in love uh you know to that extent but i do enjoy those kinds of games uh so number 20 is a street fighter 2. uh this is the only fighting game on the list uh, this is really a lot of nostalgia for this one i was in junior high when this came out uh went down to the local pizza parlor after school about once a week i kind of like my allowance week and we'd go down there we actually got in an hour early on thursdays and i'd go down there and play uh, random strangers and friends and it was very competitive and fun and it really sort of had like its own little kind of community i guess you could use that word nowadays of folks that played against each other you know and talk smack to each other and had a good time with it and then it also came out i remember on the i think it was a super nintendo system my friend had got it and when he got it we went over there i think we did you know sleepovers and all that stuff and really just played the thing to death and i played like tekken was another one that i played later mortal kombat and that kind of stuff but to me, all kinds of boils back down to Strooper, Street Fighter 2 and Street Fighter 2 uh, in the arcade. And that really was a cool, you know, experience. So you get, it's almost like a tabletop thing. You know, it's a board game channel. Uh, you know, you're just playing head to head with the person. You know, you're right there next to them. Like just, you can almost touch them, you know, with your arm. And so there's that, it's almost like an athletic thing in a way. It feels like that because it's, it's very much you're upright and you're just transmitting your your thoughts into the actions of rue or guile or anybody like that so a lot of fun with that one that was number 20. Uh, number 19 is either known as dragon quest or dragon warrior now i'm just marking this down as the first one uh, this is the only one that i've actually completed i have played some of the others a little bit later on uh, really like the whole exploration of this and one thing that i've i've gone back to and actually played this um, later on the on the iOS actually is it's very exploratory it's very kind of sandboxy open world that you've got to kind of go find different clues go talk to this guy over here go over talk to this person and they give you some coordinates and then you got to go back and forth and it's not linear at all which a lot of the more recent uh, Japanese RPGs especially and even other RPGs tend to be falling on the linear side this one had that whole kind of grind aspect to it where you had to kind of go a certain space uh, you know on the map and then you, you would get killed and so you had to kind of retreat back and then you know bounce around maybe find a cool item to bump you up in strength and so after a while after the end of it you felt like you were a badass you know you had lots of experience you know lots of deaths and you you covered every nook and cranny of the map and so you kind of get to know it and the whole exploration of it really comes through. Uh, really great game. There's been a lot of games, you know, of course, in this genre over time. But I kind of actually favor more 
usually more of that dragon warrior dragon quest type of thing over the final fantasy type of thing but i'm going to contradict myself in a little while so uh, that's number 19 in dragon quest or dragon warrior uh, number 18 is x-wing or tie fighter or x-wing versus tie fighter lots of good memories uh, playing this game we had it where we would play one person was on the PC and they would be controlling the flight stick and the other player would be controlling the keyboard because these games, uh, they had so much going on on the keyboard. I think I was in high school when this came out and there was so much, at least that it, for my little mind back then, I was still forming and everything uh, going on. You had to just kind of throw power to the shields and you know do all those different kinds of management of the ship itself. And then also the dogfighting part of it. So as you got to sort of the higher levels, it became pretty difficult to sort of manage all that. But it was a good time, though, because you had sort of your co-pilot and your main pilot. You would get kind of in sapatico. And so that was a really good experience that still sticks with me. And some of my friends, you know, that I've, uh, you know, sort of kept in touch with high school, it's actually come up in conversation and stuff. And uh, really fun, you know, again, sort of camaraderie type of experience there. Hold on, 20, 19, 18, actually number 17, got a lost count there, Walking Dead Season 1. Uh, I actually had a great time playing this with my son. He actually likes to watch me play it, funnily enough. He doesn't really care to play. He just wants to watch the story and help me uh, make the decisions for the different characters. We haven't played Season 2 yet, but I really got into this one because it kind of feels like, and I don't want to spoil, oh, it's the next game on the list, uh, which is Dragon's Lair. It kind of has that sort of quick time event, I guess is the idea where you're trying to solve sort of different little puzzles just with timing and a little bit of that old click adventure kind of thing where you go and you, you get the you know the shovel from here and you have to use it on this door or whatever and kind of put those kinds of things together. But then wrapped around that is like some moral choices and you've got different multiple paths and outcome. Uh, the ending of season one is really, really cool. The story in The Walking Dead season one is way better and the choices are much more interesting uh, and really moving in several moments and you know a lot of games they sort of advertise hey you know you get moral choices and decisions but to me this was one of the few uh, over my life and that's really sort of I said yeah this is really delivering on that promise of what you do matters uh, and that is like way oversold in <laughs> most video games in the history of my experience it does not matter uh, but really like that and a nice cool art style as well with that one uh, so the number one next one here is uh dragon's lair like i said uh this one again uh, we had a lot of fun playing this uh in the arcade wasted way too many quarters on this one because you could kind of memorize and you get to a certain point as you go through the different traps and puzzles and encounters and you'd, you'd memorize them and then you hit one you had a scene or one that was a, a little bit trickier uh, i remember uh, being at my friend's house and he had the, like the sega cd or something like that and he was a, a wizard at it and we were like no jason you play this <laughs> like we're, we're just keep playing it we'll we'll let you play we're going to watch and we're going to help you and then sometimes one of us would take over the control and you kind of play through it so that was a really cool experience as well just working your way kind of through a relatively uh, sizable amount of, of puzzles and different little encounters and again the art style of this one was like out of this world it was built on the whole laser disc technology so it looked like you were playing an actual cartoon and you know there were several games in this line kind of the don bluth line i remember there was one that was like space ace or something and then there was like a detective kind of one kind of like a sherlock holmes style character uh so that was really cool and it kind of opened your eyes to see like oh what graphics were going to be like you know in a few years maybe or what was possible it wasn't just going to be pixels and stuff like that it was going to be a little bit more photorealistic or in this case uh you know this was like cell shading uh before we we knew to call it cell shading but really really cool if you can get this i think you can get it for pc and everything uh definitely get a look at it 15 is a legend of zelda and this is the first one uh you know people will definitely argue with me that a link to the past uh for the super nintendo and then of course ocarina of time for the nintendo 64 are better games and i i would agree with that i have to mark legend of zelda the original as my favorite because i played this so much i beat it i can't tell you how many times i beat the game i actually beat the game 
in like an hour. It was right in an hour without dying. And the only thing I looked up ever as a sort of a, a cheat or a secret was there was a stupid maze like off to the left side of the map and you had to go like up left, down left or something, I don't remember. And you could get through the maze. I got so stuck on that and I was so mad at that. <laughs> and I went and read it like in a Nintendo Power or something, I found out somehow and then got through it and then I was able to complete the rest of the game. And then I got so good at it that I could beat it like in an hour without dying from start to finish, from just getting your first wooden sword all the way to fight Ganon. And uh, again, kind of hearkening back to uh, Dragon's Quest and Dragon Warrior, it was one of those where you just kind of, you know, the world was there and you went in this cave and the guy's like, hey, you're gonna need a sword. And you're like, okay. <laughs> and then you just keep going. And I remember not really realizing you know what the whole Triforce thing was. I think it's said in, in the instructions of the game, but then you get your first piece. You're like, oh, I guess I need more of these. And so you had to go find the different dungeons and there was eight dungeons and you, you know, got progressively harder and you got cool little items. So like the Zelda formula has not really changed since then. You know, you get the boomerang and then the bow and arrow and you gotta use the different things to, you know, unlock different puzzles and get across different encounters and different boss monsters. To me, this one is still, is, for me, is my favorite because I just dedicated so much time to it to get really, really good at it. And I'm sure people can be less than an hour. I actually haven't ever like searched YouTube for a speed run. Um, but yeah, to me, I never really got any better than this. I did like the second one in Link to Pass and Ocarina of Time, but uh, I haven't really played any of the newer ones like on the uh, GameCube and uh, and the Wii and stuff like that, but uh, that one's definitely my favorite. Uh, number 14 as a Super Metroid. Uh, this one I liked better than the original because it seemed like, I think the original there was like some weird buggy things or is this some stuff that, at least at the time when I was a kid, I. I couldn't really kind of grok, but then as I got a little bit older, uh, played the Super Metroid one and really liked it. Again, kind of the exploration factor of it. So you, it drops you down on the planet and you're going around, you know, shooting uh, the different bugs and stuff that are there. You're upgrading your weapons and your equipment. And you're getting cool new special abilities, but it's all about, you know, you driving the exploration yourself and kind of like, oh, you hit a wall. So you're like, okay, how do I get past this? Do I need a special missile? What do I need? You know, am I missing something or is it some little thing that's hidden up in the corner? I've got to jump up there and spin into a bomb or something. Uh, and so it really makes you explore and dig around, look for clues. And then again, you kind of grind a little bit so you can kind of you get sort of familiar with how you defeat the different bad guys. And then you just feel a, a really good sense of accomplishment, you know, at the end of the game. And you feel like a badass again, you know, you feel like you've grown. Uh, so I have, I did also enjoy the, the one for the GameCube, the 3D one. I don't really remember, but I think that got a little bit of flack for being 3D, but I thought it did a good job of translating, again, that same sort of exploration and, you know, that, that sort of Metroid formula into the 3D sort of first person shooter. Number 13 will be Doom. Now, this is basically Doom 1 and Doom 2. Uh, Doom 3, I actually enjoy, but to me there's a there's kind of a flaw with Doom 3, I'll talk about that for a second, where it seems like in that game, every time you walk through a certain part of the hallway, invariably something is gonna jump up behind you. And it's like, dude, I just walked through that point of the map and there's something behind me and it claws me for like, you know, half of my life. That's fun like the first two times where it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you get this big fright and the graphics of Doom 3 are amazing with the lighting, you know, a lot of the, the kind of the horror types of uh, games that have come out recently, which I haven't really played very much of, I think kind of derived from that. I think it does a good job of that, but I that, this, that kind of grinded on me a little bit. Now, sort of the separation of that between Doom 1 and Doom 2 and Doom 3 is you still kind of have that sort of horror aspect of it. It wasn't like always like cats jumping out of the shadows kind of horror. It was just like you'd go around a corner and like, oh my gosh, there's like 500,000 demons and the ones with the big eyes and the big, uh, you know, the big, like the guys with like the hooves and stuff. And it was more of just like a different kind of fear. And this was one of the first games that I really stayed up late, like playing. 
and it really gets you in a different mindset because you just would keep trying. And again, it's that whole exploration thing where I'd find the red key and kind of where's the red door and I'd have to unlock this secret and go back over here and you still got to maintain your ammo and all that stuff. There was a series of games called the Eye of the Beholder series, which was a first person dungeon crawl set in the D&D Forgotten Realms universe. I really like those games. And it really reminded me that in terms of the puzzle solving aspect, you go from one spot to the other and then you get to the next level and you go down and you, and you have to like conserve your health <laughs> and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then this was all about like conserving, of course, your health and then your ammo for mission to mission. Uh, but there was, you kind of got like in a strange mindset and I probably shouldn't say this on the internet, but like, at two o'clock in the morning when you're down there at the bottom of like level 50 or whatever and it feels like man i'm in here like literally in hell like killing evil <laughs> and i was like this is really interesting like i'm seeing those like those like pink dog guys you know they make that like that's the the thing that i think like burned itself into my brain the most was just those guys and just like i said rounding corners and just being surrounded you're like oh my god i'm dead you know <laughs> like you just there's so many moments of like oh i'm a, I'm a goner <laughs> i need to go redo that whole level again because i didn't do it you know very efficiently so i'm just screwed um but yeah it's just like this thing is like okay i'm like killing like principalities of of death and destruction, you know, like, okay, cool. We opened up a portal to hell and I'm literally going to go in there and like wipe everything in the hell out. And that's a very bizarre sort of mind frame to be in, but it was also very interesting and sort of like, you know, it's kind of scary a little bit. Um, so that, that game really sticks out. Next is number 12. And this is now we're starting to get to, uh, some of the stuff I hinted at earlier. And this is dragon age. This is a recent one. I have not played Dragon Age 3. Dragon Age 2 was kind of not as good as Dragon Age, so I never finished that one. This was really, really interesting. To me, there was just a lot of new things with this sort of traditional sort of turn-based RPG. You can like pause the game and then you can do sort of tactically, strategically your different encounters and your combat. That was really neat. It really fleshed out a lot of the personal backstory of your character, which is, is really being worked on right now. Uh, you know, in, in games, they're really trying to like, just take you out of like, okay, you're a big barbarian dude, or you're the cleric. They're really start pushing those boundaries somewhat with like what the character can be and then put you in these sort of crazy situations of being in this crazy fantasy world. I really also did like the, the sort of type of fantasy in this. I, I'm more of like a low fantasy than a high fantasy type of person. So this like the whole blood magic thing was really interesting where it was sort of a forbidden uh, type of art that you could get into or not get into, or you could deal with some different characters. I like the whole, um, it was like the Templars, I don't remember the name of them, but they were sort of like the Crusaders that hated pretty much all magic, especially blood magic. And the lore of the of the world, you know, it, was, it wasn't like D&D &D or something that they were uh, just, you know, deriving from. There was their own thing. It was a very interesting world and it made for a nice video game. Uh, then you had like the different you know, ways that you can encounter the characters in your party. You could have relationships with them and they could not like you and do different things like that. That was, that seemed to have, there seemed to be some weight there, although the story itself seemed less weighty based on the decisions that you can make than, for example, Walking Dead. Um, but I'm not sure of all the possibilities there, but I really enjoyed the combat system and all the different schools of magic and the different characters and controlling all those different abilities. So if you think of an MMO kind of thing, it's like I'm controlling the healer and the tank and all those different things. Um, very interesting, cool graphics, you know, the animations and the different skills, they, they all went together and everything really just hooked together very nicely. Uh, number 11 is Icewind Dale which is a forebearer to like Dragon Age and, you know, Wasteland 2 and all that kind of stuff. Now, you will not see Baldur's Gate on here. And I honestly <laughs> would get bored to tears and fall asleep while I was reading Baldur's Gate. Now, Icewind Dale always seemed to me to have a little bit more... Hmm, the story just was more interesting to me. It was more of a D&D &D kind of thing where it like dropped you in. You were just some group of adventurers that happened to be there and you were dropped in. This was your campaign and then there was lots of fighting. And I liked that. I liked the whole tactical visceral combat of it. It seemed to happen more often in Icewind Dale than Baldur's Gate. And then have this whole like 
you know, you're the forgotten chosen one stuff, you know, that kind of is, is a trope. But it was just straight, like, I felt like I was playing D&D with my friends in this environment. So Baldur's Gate just bored me, and I'm sorry for that. I know Baldur's Gate is probably the better game, and it has, like, much more story and all that stuff. But at the time, and I've tried to get back into it now, it doesn't resonate with me. But Icewind Dale I liked because I liked that setting. I, I read all the Icewind Dale books and all, all the series, not all of them, but most of the series derived from that. So it kind of hooked me in that way. And like I said, it was more of just a regular D&D campaign with, you know, I threw in some different characters and some, there's some archetypes and I could get in and do, get into the visceral tactical combat. And I really, really enjoyed that. Now we're in the top 10. So number 10 is Final Fantasy 3 or 6. Now in the US it was 3, in Japan it was 6. This is by far my favorite Final Fantasy. I've played several of them. I played 1 and 2, and like some Game Boy 1, and then 3, and I played 7, and I played uh, some of 8, I didn't finish 8, I played 9 and 10, and I haven't really played anything after that. I think I dinked around with a demo of 13 or something, but um, I played a good amount of them. This one by far, <laughs> the funny thing is, is I did not expect what I was getting out of this. Um, you know, I, I, I enjoyed the first Final Fantasies, but this one seemed like it never ended. Like the story just kept going and there were twists. And then at one point you were like on the moon and then you, I was like, oh, the, the end's gonna be on the moon. And I was like, oh, we're coming back down here and now we're gonna go here. And this other person is not who I thought they were. And you know, back and forth and back and forth. And the graphics at the time were very interesting because it was on the Super Nintendo and it had like that little extra graphics and you could fly around and in the airships and all that stuff and just, you know, it felt like a huge, vast world that just like, oh my gosh, there's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. And the story was, at the time, was like, wow, this is a video game. It's a, you know, but the story just keeps unraveling. I feel like I'm in like this huge mini series of books and just so immersed and, you know, just, you keep scaling up. I like this better than Final Fantasy VII, I gotta say. Again, I got kind of bored with Final Fantasy VII, you know, uh, I finished it. It kind of gets back to that whole like the cloud guy was dreaming about his past i just like that kind of stuff like this kind of wears than me like does everyone have to be luke skywalker in these things it's like come on um so i liked six better or three however you call it and it was just like a little bit more like like it didn't take itself as seriously as seven i think is kind of the vibe of it um now seven of course has way better graphics and i'm probably kind of interested to go back and play the remaster of seven that's coming up just to kind of revisit that and see how that goes. Uh, I would say my second favorite is probably nine. I really liked nine. It kind of felt like, again, it didn't take itself too seriously. Um, you know, it was just, it was just kind of fun. I don't really want to be like, you know, my guy's like Kylo Ren and he's brooding and he's emo all the time. I'm like, oh, okay, what, you know, like it's just weighing down on my psyche here. Like, I just want to have fun. I want to escape all that stuff. That's number 10, Final Fantasy three or six. Um, Continuing on the theme of, of these RPGs, number nine is Mass Effect. Awesome. I almost finished Mass Effect 2. I just kind of got bored of it and stopped, and I haven't played Mass Effect 3. Uh, I really, really enjoyed Mass Effect. Everything I said about Dragon Age applies to Mass Effect. I do like the theme of Mass Effect a little bit better. It's It's got sci-fi, but it has that nice sort of narrative from kind of putting in a little bit of back history from kind of like now ish in earth to you know we get discovered sort of like in star trek you know with these alien races and we discover this whole big conflict that's been going on and you've got to deal with the different races i think it's a little bit more exploratory than dragon age where you could kind of just go off and do stuff a little bit and it felt like you would get away from this sort of big overarching plot whereas in dragon age you everything kind of ties back into that but in Mass Effect, you could just go on and like explore and just find these planets and drive the little tank around and just go have these cool encounters. And the combat system in Mass Effect is really neat because it's Dragon Age, you know, is a lot like Isom Dale in those games, but just from a different perspective, whereas Mass Effect is like a first person shooter and it can be a tactical sort of shooter slash, you know, Dragon Age turn-based kind of thing. And that was, that's really neat. That's, uh, that felt very different to me. And I really like that. And I really like the cool abilities where you could, like toss people and, you know, all the different sort of, um, I can't remember what it was called. It was like using the force or something, but you could do different stuff like that. And then you had other people that were more like, you know, augmented, like technologically. That was cool. Uh, so number eight is Super Mario Galaxy. 
This is definitely my favorite Mario game. I also like Super Mario Galaxy 2. I, I like the others, you know, like Super Mario Brothers 1 and 2 and 3 and Super Mario, Brother, uh, Super Mario World. Also like that. Super Mario 64 was also really cool. But Galaxy to me, just the the immensity of the 3D weird, you know, transitions from one dimension to the other and you're like running around planets and then shooting across and teleporting and all that kind of crazy stuff just was like, it's so sort of like delightful to play, you know, whimsical and it wasn't like as bs -y as the early ones were. I would say from the early ones, Super Mario World is my favorite because it was still a difficulty, but it wasn't like, you know, in, in Super Mario 1 and 3 to an extent, you was like, you had to go like reset different degrees, you know, based on like one was stupid because it was like, oh, I died, I have to restart the whole game, you know. In, in, in Super Mario World and 64 and, and, and Galaxy, you could get to a certain point, save and unlock worlds and there were secret worlds and all that. And Galaxy, like I said, just has that cool graphics, just that different level of gameplay that wasn't just a straight platformer like every other game. It really just takes it to that weird level that I haven't really seen um, in many games. So that's definitely my favorite Mario. Let's see, that will be number seven coming up is Battlefield. 1942 is the one I'm putting here. I kind of go back and forth between this one and Vietnam and then Battlefield 2. Now, Battlefield 2 is probably the best engine of them. I played some of the newer ones and they're like crap, I think. The thing with Battlefield 2 is the jets and stuff were kind of kind of crazy and the helicopters and it was like a little bit too heavy on the vehicles and all that. And even Vietnam a little bit could be kind of crazy. I used to play with a friend of mine and he was just like a wizard at anything flying. It was just like ridiculous to play with him. And Battlefield 42 felt a little bit more balanced in terms of that regard where you could kind of take out planes a little easier and all that stuff uh so and this was the first one and the others were just really kind of repeating and iterating on that formula but it was really the first game where it was like okay you could be on your feet you could be in a jeep you could be in a tank it could be in an airplane all kinds of stuff and they had very different modes of gameplay. There were some maps that were super tight and you spent more time on your feet and there were other maps that were really wide open and spread out. And I liked the whole objective thing. And if you got on a team that, you know, excelled at the teamwork, you could really get into like controlling certain objectives and trying to be very smart about it. And you could really get in and, and get into the map and it wasn't just about like knowing corners like a lot of the shooters like i've got to know this corner and this corner and that's where the guy's going to snipe me from it was really about the terrain and not just like the corridors of the maps like many shooters were um excellent excellent game and nice you know next notch up in the innovation a lot of games like this battlefront game they're at least the original the new one sucks but um you know, that's cool. And then like Planet Side is a one that I thought about putting on this list because the original Planet Side was really, really cool until they ruined it. <laughs> um, but yeah, this really interesting kind of more wide open shooter was really cool. Uh, next one here is number six. <laughs> Another one uh, that I'm a sucker for, Knights of the Old Republic. Um, again, kind of like a Mass Effect Dragon Age thing. Really, really interesting story. It's set in the Star Wars universe, of course. Uh, it's like, you know, set in the Old Republic, like it says. Really got into the story of this because it's Star Wars and because of kind of the exploration that it did in terms of the extended universe. You kind of learn a little bit more about the Force, like the whole battle mastery thing. This is close to my favorite RPG ever. All kinds of different open world things to go do. And also just the main storyline is really interesting. The mystery and sort of the reveals at the end are really cool. Very well adheres to Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. Um, I know a lot's been said about that. Uh, so number five is a Rogue Spear, and this is a Rainbow Six game. And funnily enough, I've been playing the new Rainbow Six, uh, which is a Siege. And I really like that one too. It does some different stuff. To me, the Rogue Spear was the one that sticks out because we used to play it at work at lunch as like a LAN. And we would play, we'd crank the AI on the terrorists to the hardest possible mode, and then everybody loads in there. And really, as a team, work through and piece together and crawl through all the different scenarios and maps and get to you know the point where we'd kill all the terrorists and stuff very very 
good like team building kind of a thing um, that I really enjoyed about it. And very much more a tactical shooter in terms of, you know, strategy and positioning, you know, getting back to the whole corridor thing. But again, a little bit more terrain oriented. It's not so, so much like a twitch thing. It's like setting people up to draw fire and do all kinds of stuff like that. It really excels. The newest one that's come out besides Siege is the, the New Vegas one. Not New Vegas, just Vegas. I'm thinking of Fallout. Uh, the Vegas one. That was also fun. I played that a lot online. That one was cool because you had like the whole tactical kind of like Mass Effect ordering of your troops and stuff, which is really neat. So I really like this. But again, like playing, I've been playing this online too. The new one where we we go and we do like a terrorist hunt, or we try to protect a hostage, or we try to uh, you know go get a hostage out and play mostly against the computer. But I like that whole tactical thing. It's it that will suck me in if you get me into a shooter you know the tactics of it you know and that's kind of the board game side coming out i guess as opposed to the twitch side of it number four uh first one on here i guess this one is kind of an rts uh it's civilization of five now understand most people think civilization four is better i disagree <laughs> but civilization five with the expansions to me is the better game i love civilization board games this is by far my favorite civilization you know computer game i've played a few others and some fantasy ones and different things sort of like in that 4x genre but i really like just how you manage everything in this game like the tech trees the resources and the food and the stone and uh, you know interacting with the different leaders and the city states and you know kind of balancing your economy versus your your well your naval fleet which is very important in this game early on and then you know just getting to that point we kind of hit that critical mass uh, you know i played it against like just vast different numbers of ai I tried it online a few times it just takes forever um i've won it a few times on the hard ai but a lot of times it'll it'll beat you down and you know you have to kind of readjust and everything and I like i like the whole asymmetrical powers of you know the different leaders and all that stuff and it's just this one of these games that i can just really uh, i try not try to stay away from because it'll eat your time away and it's you know they they say just one more turn and that is such the truth with this game where you just can just get lost and you're like oh i gotta do this now oh no i gotta go do this thing i gotta go do this and i don't usually like the micromanagement stuff like sims uh, sim city and you know most rts's but because this is turn-based i think i get into it a little bit more you can kind of just put it away and sit down and then get back to it um, and I think the graphics are very amazing and just the whole interface, not necessarily like the renderings, but just the interface of how you get at all your data and everything is just blows me away with this one. Okay. So top three, number three is Neverwinter Nights. And that is the, uh, definitely the top of this style of RPG, that kind of turn-based, you know, sort of isometric thing. Now I got a lot into creating my own modules and playing other people's modules for this. The main campaign is really, really cool. I completed that. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. It's a very, again, epic involved story with lots of cool forks in the plot, but it also kind of reminded me of Icewind Dale where it kind of gets back to you feel like you're kind of a normal D&D &D character. It's no like messianic, you know, junk in there. It's just, I'm the sky, I rolled them up, he's in there, and then now we're getting a group together. And, you know, we're dealing with this, this town in Neverwinter and the sort of deviant forces that are at work here. And then, you know, it kind of takes you to the next place and the next place. Now the game creator module, you know, they have a new game called Sword Coast, which is trying to replicate that, which doesn't, really do a good job of it. That game's actually decent though. I like Sword Coast. I spent so much time in the module creator and playing around with other people's modules. And you had this thing where you could like link module worlds and stuff and people would create like their own little mini MMOs. So much time just basically wasted playing around in this, like creating encounters. You could create scripts and just be a DM and have your friends come and like run through a dungeon. I mean, just, blew me out of the water. I had so much fun with it. And the tool itself was so easy to integrate, so easy to set up. Um, there were some nice guides they made for it. Uh, I mean, I just got literally lost. I mean, hundreds of hours with this one, just completely lost. And again, everything across the board with this game was really cool. The interface for the actual gameplay was such that it made it easy to drop modules in and then you would know how to interact with all that stuff. It just 
I mean, it's just an amazing piece of software, really, uh, at the end of the day. I could just, you know, you could just talk about that one forever. Uh, number two is uh, Fallout 3. This is another one that I invested at least 100 hours in, was what it said, told me when I was done with it, which was completing the entire game and every piece of downloadable content for it on the Xbox. Yeah, this, I, like I said, I enjoyed Wasteland 2 and I did enjoy the old uh, Fallout uh, 1. I don't think I ever played Fallout 2, but Fallout 1 when it came out, and the, actually the original Wasteland as well. I'm a sucker for the post-apocalyptic kind of setting with the wasteland of radioactive stuff. And Fallout 3 was awesome. It's basically oblivion in the post-apocalyptic. So you won't see any oblivion or Morrowind or anything like that here. This is the one for me. If actually Fallout 4 is a little bit of a disappointment because they kind of went with that whole uh, like building up your town and stuff. Like I, I don't care about that. I want to be like the lone guy out there in the wasteland just trying to eke it out and um you know going from place to place sort of like bruce banner and the hulk or whatever just kind of wander from town to town getting into adventures that to me is sort of the thing like you know mad max he doesn't try to like run a town you know in the pun he doesn't like that's you know the point of those stories to me is kind of like okay yeah you create civilization but then that comes at its own cost and so that in a sense makes it harder to survive because you've got to sort of deal with all the politics and sort of ramifications of dealing with all the people. Um, that sounds kind of pessimistic, but I mean, in a post-apocalyptic world, that might actually be uh, the case where it's better to kind of be on your own or maybe in a small band of people kind of cruising around and not staying in one place too much. That's kind of my own bias coming out there, but Fallout 3 was that just massive world, you know, all kinds of guns and different things you could get, crazy armor, these different encounters, just endless, 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 endless uh, things. And you could, it was really that whole sandbox thing where it's like, I could talk to this person, I could just take them out, I could do whatever, befriend them. Uh, so just awesome gameplay, awesome mechanics, and you know, enough has been said about that as well. That's my number two. And my number one is Ultima Online, which I could literally probably do a video talking about that for like three hours. Um, it's one of the first massively multiplayer games to ever come out. I think it was the first one to make any kind of splash. Um, it's very open-ended. It's not like World of Warcraft and those kind of games that are sort of derived from World of Warcraft. It's, it's much more open. You could have player housing, you plop down land and that was yours. You had to defend it. There was no guards or anything like that. You know, outside of the main towns, if you tried to rob people in town, the guards could be called and they could just jack you up and kill you. But uh, on the server I played on at the time called Sonoma, there was a town up in the oasis area this is a big desert and it was a player driven town and every friday night they would have fight night and they built a little arena and people could place bets and there was their own guards their own police and people would show up and try to rob people or or, or player killers you know people that were like murderers would basically show up and try to wipe everybody out and then everybody would band together to fight them and it was all player driven and we had a little uh little neighborhood of our own with some friends locally here and we had our own little like little village almost it was like four or five houses and we trained together because it wasn't like a level up kind of skill thing it was like you did a thing and you just kind of leveled up kind of like in Morrowind or something where if you just do a thing repetitively you get better so we train and then we band together and we go on dungeons and so you'd go into a dungeon and try to try to kill the big dragon but the thing you were really worried about was the other players down there trying to kill the players who were trying to kill the dragon which had the really cool loot um, so you had to do that and there was guilds and factions and and then they created champ spawns you know those would give you like these uber power scrolls that would like unlock your your stat cap and you could get above the stat cap so instead of like a hundred majory you could have 120 majory or 120 swordsmanship and you'd be really strong if you got that stuff unlocked um so that was like the prime spot and everybody would try to go there and then you could just go there and try to pick people off as they were trying to get out of there with the scrolls and so turn into these huge like guild battles like trying to vying for control of the spawn and then meanwhile you have this massive chaos of these really hard npc creatures killing everybody anyway i mean this game there's there's so many so many so many so many so many stories of just i run into somebody we have an encounter it could go peacefully it could go badly um 
and it's just like running into people like in, in the real world sort of. And this was the only MMO that I've played that felt like it was a virtual world. You know, it was like you stepped in and you were Eka Mouse or whoever in the game and you had a reputation, you know, the people knew, some people knew who you were, they liked you, they didn't like you, they trusted you or they didn't trust you or you had a certain guild moniker, you know, so, you know, different guilds looked at you certain ways. Uh, the game had like a built-in reputation system, which wasn't just like a number that you increased like in WoW. If you killed somebody without provocation, you would get like a murder count. Uh, depending on which patch you were playing, you could like kill the guy, take his head, <laughs> turn it to the bounty board because people would throw bounty money on you. So many different things. And then after a while, you could like customize your own houses and design all that kind of stuff. So, it, it, you know, you can really personalize it. I know my, my friend actually, his girlfriend at the time was playing and she really got into like customizing her house. So she designed her house and she decorated it and she, there were so many different like decorations and stuff you could do. There was like rare materials that you could get. You know, you could set up vendors outside your house. You could set up vendor communities so people would put their rare items, their magic items or their rare decorations or different things. And so there was a community around that. You know, this is like our little, little market here on the street that we all participated in. Just so many different things that you could do in the game and not even actually go fight. I mean, you could make just craftsmen if you wanted to. And it was like a legitimate thing. It was like an interesting uh, player economy as well. There was rarity of uh, different, you know, resources and ores. There was like Valorite ingots were like the super rare uh, ingot you could, you know, make plate armor and stuff with, and you could get magical properties on them. I mean, there's so many just, details and nooks and crannies of this world that you could fully get into and then again you had that sort of personal i don't know it's like a personal investment because like i said you had a reputation there was like oh there goes eka mouse that ass you know <laughs> who killed me in the graveyard one day for no reason or he sold me a blank spell book or something like that you know just stuff like that would happen and so that just gave it a reality um and the game is still going today uh, they since like nerfed it, you know, sort of as time's gone by because when EverQuest came out, which was sort of the big one before World of Warcraft, uh, that was a little bit more friendly in terms of the player interaction. Uh, there was some like what they call PK servers, but most people played it as they wanted to kind of play D&D. They would get into groups and they would just kill you know, NPCs over and over again and try to upgrade their levels and get their loot. It wasn't really about the, it wasn't the Ultima style, because Ultima was always about morality and, you know, taking your character different ways with reputation. Uh, it was more, you know, I'm trying not to be uh, derogatory, because I, I did play EverQuest in a while, and I did enjoy those, kind of, and not as much as Ultima, but it's kind of like Disneyland versus, um, you know, a sandbox. So in EverQuest, and, and definitely more with World of Warcraft, it was like, here's your dungeon. We've set it up nicely for you. You can go and run through it. You can learn kind of the tricks of the bosses as you fight through them and some of the different encounters. And then at the end, you'll get a nice little reward <laughs> that you can go on your way home. That's fine. It's fun, you know. Um, but this Ultima was more like, here's a gigantic planet. Enjoy. <laughs> you know, and that's a completely different experience. Uh, so yeah. anyway, that's the top 20 video games. Uh, hopefully that was worth it to some people probably a walk down memory lane. I'm kind of showing my age with like Legend of Zelda and Street Fighter 2 and all that, uh, and for Ultima Online. But um, uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, that's my top 20 games and maybe list your top 10 or 20 games that you have enjoyed. I know that I know there's a ton, a ton of good games that I did not mention. Uh, you know, if anything, there's a ton of board games put out every year. There's like a million times more video games put out every year and there's a lot of good ones. A lot of new, different ones that are coming out. Um, what's another one? I played the Stanley Parable. That's a weird game. That's cool though. It's kind of like, uh, you know, video games are kind of becoming a little bit more artistic, like, you know, sort of breaking different boundaries and what they can do. Uh, there's some other ones where you like play as somebody that is playing in the game. I can't remember the name of these because I haven't played, where you like, you play somebody that gets into a relationship through an MMO and then you've got to sort of manage the MMO and this whole like virtual Facebook thing, you know, uh, crazy, you know, so that's a really weird, interesting 
and I mean weird in a good way, you know, interesting sort of way that those things are kind of going and being allowed to evolve into. Um, and you can go play like Call of Duty and stuff too, which I also enjoy. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's a it's a crazy art form, and it really is an art form in a lot of ways. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Thanks.